Well, it's already been a beautiful start to a wonderful day as we've gathered here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Certainly good to see each and every one of you able to come and be with us. And we're also thankful for all those that are joining us by the way of the internet. And we want to continue to pray one for another. Don't forget about the funeral services for Faye Tucker tomorrow at Alamance Cemetery at 1 o'clock. Faye and uh, her husband had been a member here at the church for a long time, very active members until they had moved down to Shiloh, uh, North Carolina. And we are uh, just uh, going to be having a, a graveside service for Faye tomorrow. She had coronavirus, and we want to remember that whole family in prayer in a very special way. Johnny McKinney is going to be having some procedures done tomorrow on his back, and also Mike Williams may be going to Duke Hospital tomorrow to have some procedures done concerning cancer and things of that nature. We're going to be having a time of prayer in just a few moments, and uh, uh, we'll get into that a little bit more in a little bit. But at this time, Brother Alvin wants to come and share some thoughts with us as well. Good morning. I'd like to welcome each one here. For information, uh, we have found out Carol Stiles is stepping down as treasurer of church after 17 years. I'd like to thank all the service she has given our church. And she had nominated information to that Courtney Barnett to take her position. The deacons have talked to her. I think Dominic has talked to her. And we have uh, interviewed her and talked to her, and she told us a few things too. So we are suggesting that Courtney take care of her position. We'll, we'll vote on Courtney uh, when we do our nominate committee information. Thank y'all. Well, it's hard to believe it's already August, and of course our physical year starts in September, so it won't be long before new officers and things of that nature will be stepping up. And I think there's still some openings if you're interested in helping out in different areas of the church. See some of those folks that are on the nominating committee, some of the children's uh, ministries as far as the Sunday school classes and things of that nature are still looking for some help and some of the youth classes as well. And they're also looking for people that would be uh, willing to help out with some of the technology uh, upstairs uh, during the services as well. But at this time, uh, Livy's going to come and share a song with us, and let's just let God speak to our heart now through this song. Let's really get set in the motion of worshiping the Lord now here at the church. Amen. It's gonna be okay 
It's gonna be okay From beginning to the end You're so close You have never let me down And you won't In the valleys and the shadows I know You're so close You're so close may be moved into the sea Though the ground beneath might crumble and give way I can hear my father singing over me It's gonna be okay It's gonna be okay It's gonna be okay It's gonna be okay Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, as a child of God, that's one thing we can be assured of. We're going to be okay. Amen. Well, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And, of course, we want to pray one for another. We want to pray certainly for this nation. And we want to pray for all the churches that are in service this morning. And we want to pray that all that are lost would be saved. And let's really pray for a lot of people to get saved. But let's also pray for Christians to get on fire for the glory of God. And I really believe that we're nearing very close to the very second coming of the Lord. Of course, there's several things that's going to take place before the Lord literally comes back to this earth. But I believe we're right at the preface. It's the very, very point that the Lord could rapture the church out of harm's way. But let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Let's pray one for another. Our Heavenly Father, what a privilege you've given us to be able to come here to your house today. And already, dear God, I have felt your presence, and it has lifted my soul, dear God. And you have placed joy within my heart, and you reassured my hope, dear Heavenly Father. It's going to be all right. Lord, I pray that I just keep my eyes on you and not allow the storm to distract me, not allow the thunder to uh, cause me to uh, uh, waver or be afraid. But, Lord, I am just thankful for all that you have already done for us, even through all this turmoil that is going on. I know it's going to be all right. Lord, I pray, dear God, for all that are sick and afflicted, and we've got so many in the church that are battling all kinds of difficulties we pray, dear Heavenly Father, for those, dear God, today that are battling problems in their homes. We're, we're praying, dear Heavenly Father, for those that are looking at some financial situations, dear God. A lot of people facing very, a lot of people are facing a lot of physical uh, needs, dear God. And we pray for all those that are battling cancer. We want to remember Ruth Carter in prayer, dear Heavenly Father. We want to pray, dear Heavenly Father, for uh, Mike Williams, dear God. We want to pray for Tim Hazlip, dear Heavenly Father. We want to pray for everybody that's battling cancer, dear God, not intending to look, overlook anyone. Praying for everybody that's battling the MS, dear God, with Mary and uh, Kelly and Tammy, dear Heavenly Father. Praying for Bonnie, dear God. Praying for Johnny, who will be having that back procedures tomorrow, dear Lord. Praying for Mike as he goes to Duke Hospital and his bout with cancer, dear Heavenly Father. We're praying, dear Heavenly Father, and asking you to be with Nancy, dear God, who's having some situations with her eyes, dear God. Praying for Lorraine, dear God, Linda Rainey, dear Heavenly Father. We're praying, dear Heavenly Father, that you'll continue, dear Lord, to be with all these precious folks in a very special way. All of them that are in the nursing homes, dear God, we've got so many that are there, dear Heavenly Father, and asking you to be there. Continuing to pray for Anthony, dear Heavenly Father, glad he's getting better. Lord, again, now just thank you for allowing us to come here today. And Lord, we're praying that God, you would intervene in this nation. We're praying that, dear Heavenly Father, you'd tear down the strongholds of Satan that has been established, dear God, in many places. And, dear Heavenly Father, I pray you would arrest every demonic activity that is going on, dear God. And I pray in the name of Jesus that, dear Heavenly Father, you would give us a holy boldness, that, God, we would take a stand and that we would lift up Jesus Christ, dear God, without apology, without being ashamed. And, Lord, I pray that you would come soon, dear God, and take the church out of here. And I pray that those that are lost would get saved before it's too late for them. For these things we ask are in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask Olivia to come back again and sing another song for us this morning.
Praise the good Lord. I thank uh, Olivia for coming and sharing those beautiful songs with us today. I know most people already know that she's my daughter because she looks so much like me. And, and uh, so there wasn't no question about that. But uh, it is good to be back in the house of the Lord, isn't it? And the crowd just seems like picking up just a few more every Sunday, and it is wonderful. I'm glad you're able to come and be with us here for this service. If you will, once again, turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. We're going to begin reading with verse number 1 as we did last Sunday morning and go through verse number 12. God allowed me to start a, a series of messages last Sunday concerning thy kingdom come. A lot of times when we are very young, we are taught the Lord's Prayer, and we have prayed it who knows how many times since then. And most people probably here in the service today could quote the Lord's Prayer. But a part of the Lord's Prayer that really I don't think a lot of people have comprehended or understand completely is the fact that right in the second verse, it is saying that when we are praying, we are be praying, Thy kingdom come. Now that literally means that we're looking for God to bring the kingdom of heaven down here to earth. And we're saying in the latter part of that prayer is, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now a lot of people really have not comprehended the fact that one day this world will be a new heaven. It's going to be a new earth. And God is going to reign and rule here in this beautiful place here on earth. There are several things that are going to have to transpire before that happens. And that's where we started last Sunday morning when we started looking at what the Bible here will tell us in a few moments from the book of 2 Thessalonians that there's going to have to be a falling away first. And we started looking at some of the characteristics of the falling away. And I literally believe with all my heart that we are right in that very moment of the church falling away from God. But not only the church as a whole, but also all of the people uh, that are unsaved are constantly badgering Christians and things of that nature. So when we look into this passage of Scripture here again this morning, if you will please stand with me, we're going to continue on with this, and we're going to go in this series all the way through as much as we know in the Bible until God creates the new heaven and the new earth. So we got a lot of ground to cover over the next good number of weeks, and I hope that you will continue to come and listen and learn from the Word of God. So from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand." Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, remember you not? That when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now led us will let until be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceiviousness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Our Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for your presence and thank you for your word. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit, dear God, that is guiding us and teaching us, dear Heavenly Father, about the present state in which we are in. But also, dear God, you have given us direction through your word as to what's coming up, dear Heavenly Father, in the future. Help us, dear God, to learn and to apply these things to our own lives. Lord, give me the words to say now in the hour that they need to be said. Be with every man of God throughout the world. Let you be lifted up and glorified, dear Heavenly Father, and let souls be saved, dear God, and Christians put on fire for the glory of your name. For these things I ask are in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated today. As I continue to look at this passage of Scripture, God continues to remind me of the fact that there's a lot of people who really have never heard about the second coming of the Lord. Here at this church, you might find that to be almost unbelievable because we do preach about the second coming of the Lord quite a bit. But really and truly, we should preach about the Lord, the second coming, quite a bit because the Bible is absolutely filled with the wonderful prophetic knowledge that Jesus Christ is coming back to this world for the second time. Matter of fact, there's more in the Bible about the second coming of the Lord than there is concerning the first coming. And we know that the Bible was fulfilled. All the prophecies leading right up to the point that Jesus Christ was to be born, Jesus Christ was to die, and all these things that were transpired the first advent, the first time that Jesus Christ come to this world. But the Bible is clear. He is coming back again. But there's a lot of churches that don't preach about this at all. As a matter of fact, I was in my 20s before I'd ever heard anything about the Lord coming back to this earth. And I was brought up in church. And I knew about David and Goliath, and I knew about Moses crossing the Red Sea and the manna from heaven and things of that nature. But I had never heard anything about the return of the Lord. I'd never heard anything about the rapture of the church. I'd never heard anything about the tribulation period. Jesus was speaking in the book of Matthew, and in the book of Matthew chapter 16, and in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 1 through verse number 3, Jesus is being confronted by those who are supposed to be the religious elite of his day. And they are trying to trip up Jesus. And in verse number 1 of Matthew chapter 16, the Bible says the Pharisees, also with them Sadducees. These are the top of the top of the Jewish religious hierarchy. They are coming to Jesus, and they were always trying to catch him at some fault or another. And so the Pharisees also, with the Sadducees, came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And in verse number 2, it goes on to say, And he answered and said unto them, When is it evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. He is saying, you have learnt enough in your lifetime to know that in the evening, if the sky is a certain color of this nature or another, that it will help you to know what will be coming through the night or in the early morning hours. But then he goes on to say in verse number 3, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. There's more people who are more concerned with what the weather's going to be tomorrow than they are with the truthful fact that Jesus Christ could come back today. And people right now, probably for the most part on a large scale, percentage-wise, has already checked what the weather's going to be today. They've already checked what the weather's going to be all next week. I can tell you, you can know what the weather's going to be 10 years from now. But if you ain't ready for Jesus Christ, who could come for the church at any second now, you could be left behind facing hell itself. So Jesus here is telling these religious people... You might think it's important for you to know what the weather conditions might be tomorrow, but what's even more important is the signs of the time. And so spiritually, people that are saved, 
we should have a very clear inkling as to what time it is, spiritually speaking. And so one of the things that are going to have to take place before Jesus Christ comes back is, according to Thessalonians here, that there's going to have to be a falling away. Now, we looked at this last week, and we found out that the falling away literally means the Greek word apostasy, apostasy. So we're living right now in the time of apostasy. That's the Greek word, apostasy. We're living in the time of apostasy. What does apostasy mean? What does falling away mean? It means departure. It means revolt or rebellion. In terms of religious apostasy, it is the abandonment of or a free or a willful falling away from the faith. It can be defined as the departure of religious practices, a rejection of beliefs once agreed upon, and even mockery of the religion. That's exactly where we're living right now. And it's escalating on a whole scale level. It's getting worse and it's getting worse by the day, by the moment. And so we're living in the time of apostasy. And so today, I want us to continue to look and to see what we can expect living in the time of apostasy. Because guess what? We need to know that if we believe that the Lord could come back at any moment, we need to know the signs of the times in a sense. And one of the signs of the time is the apostasy time that we're looking at. That means, yeah, we can get excited about getting raptured out. Woo, I'm ready for that. But it also means we're going to have to be living during the time of apostasy, that falling away period before the Lord takes the church out of harm's way. So when I look into the Word of God, and the Word of God is very precise, and the Word of God gives us a lot of information concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's telling us that before the Lord does come back for the church, and when I say the church, I'm talking about every born-again believer. Many people today don't believe that he's coming back, though. Do you believe in your heart right now that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment? I literally do. I mean, at any second. I mean, literally, any second. If you're lost, I could disappear before your very eyes. People around you could disappear before your very eyes in a heartbeat. I mean, in a twinkling of an eye, we could disappear from this sanctuary. That's how close I believe we are because we've already seen the state of apostasy in effect in a very strong way. But there's a lot of people that don't believe it because, listen to me, if everybody really that claims to be Christians really believed in the second coming of the Lord, friend, I want to tell you something, this church still be full today. This church would be full today. They wouldn't be worrying about the coronavirus because they're looking to get out. They're looking to get up. And they're looking to be with the Lord pretty soon. Amen. And so I don't think a lot of people are looking. I think a lot of people are falling away. And I mean, I believe a lot of Christians have fell in the water. I believe a lot of people have just give up on church. And of course, the government has helped them with this pandemic situation that's going on. And the people, when the churches have been closed, it's just given them the opportunity just to get further and further and further away from God. And I really believe, unless there's a great revival, that even when all the churches can open up completely, that a lot of people ain't going to come back. A lot of people ain't going to be as faithful as they once were. There's a lot of positions that won't never be filled in the churches again. And we're living in that time when there is a great falling away. And I believe a lot of people could fit into this category that's found in 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, this is very alarming, but it's also very clear that it's happening right now in this day in which we're living. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Do you know there's some people right now don't want to go to heaven? I'm telling you the truth. I've heard them tell me, well, I'm ready to go, but I don't want to go right now. I'm ready to go right now. Amen. I'm looking forward to heaven. And I want to go to heaven. I want to get out of this. I'm a stranger here. This ain't my home. I mean, I'm a stranger. I'm just a pilgrim passing through. 
But there's a lot of people, they want to hang on for a little bit longer. They want to just hang around a while longer. Listen to me. There's scoffers in the world right now that are walking around after their own lust and saying, now these are scoffers, they're saying, where is the promise of his coming? Now, I want to tell you, people have preached and taught about the second coming of the Lord, and I've been doing it for 40-some years, and during that 40-some year period of time, I thought any moment it could happen. But I am more convinced right now that it could happen now more so than I ever believed it could have when I first started preaching about 40-some years ago. There's so many firsts. There's so many things right now that are, that are happening right here in America that you would have never dreamed that it would have happened. Could you have ever, could you have ever conceived that the churches would have been closed? Could you have ever have conceived the things that are going on in America right now and Christians are being uh, per, uh, uh, persecuted in many ways and they're being belittled and they're being mocked? You, you show me a Christian on a television program I'm going to tell you, they're going to be mocking that Christian and making fun of them, or they're going to be making that Christian look like the hideous, horriblest type of human being that there ever was. They are, portraying, they are portraying Christianity today in a lot of shows. They could be a gangster, drug dealer, harlots, and everything else. They'll have big crosses on their, on their necklaces and all these different things. They'll be sitting there doing all this right there before they kill 50 people. And, you know, you know I'm telling you the truth. We're living in that time and saying, well, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Boy, I'm telling you what, they're blind as a bat. But the natural man cannot discern the things of the Spirit. The Bible clearly says that. Only those that are spiritual can really discern the things of the Spirit. Only those that are spiritual can see the signs of the times. And we're looking at this, God is not slack. My answer to any one of those who say, well, where is his coming? Things haven't changed. Friends, what hole have you been hiding in? I mean, even a blind person can see that things have really drastically changed a lot in the last three months particularly. Listen, well, where's God at? Well, I want to tell you something. God is not slack concerning his promise. He's not slack concerning his promise. A thousand years to us is like one day to the Lord. Boy, I'm telling you, God was not slack in the days of Noah, was it? Noah got to preach for 150 years, wasn't it? Didn't he get to preach for about 150 years to the people trying to tell them judgment's coming, judgment's coming? Noah building on that ark, building on that ark. Finally, God said, okay. God was not slack. God tried, but that was all right. Wasn't God willing to spare Sodom? For ten righteous people? Wasn't God willing to spare? God is not slack concerning his, his promise. The Bible goes on to say, though, in that passage of Scripture, when we look at 2 Peter chapter 3, listen to verse number 5. And 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 5, the Bible says, For this they willingly are ignorant of. They choose not to believe. They choose not to believe that all that is happening is a sign leading up to the second coming of the Lord. They choose this. They willingly are ignorant of this. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. They, even to this day, don't believe in the flood. You believe that? There's a lot of people today who think we're crazy because we believe that God sent a flood to this earth and destroyed mankind, all but Noah and his family at one time. They, don't, they choose not to believe that. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care if they ever find that part of the ark over there in Turkey. You know, ever so often you'll see it on the computer. Well, they found a part of the ark. Give me a break. You know, I don't care if they find the part of the ark or not. The Bible says that that settles it. I'm going to believe God. And when God says that he got tired of mankind and the wickedness of the world, that he sent judgment on the world, I believe he did it. And I believe he's going to do it again. When I look at that passage of Scripture, and I continue to read on there again in uh, the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 9, and I've already made mention of this somewhat. But the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everybody to go to heaven. And everybody that winds up in hell, they choose to go there. They choose to reject Jesus Christ as the Son of God. 
They choose willingly to uh, uh, reject that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. They willingly choose not to accept that. And so they will one day wind up in that terrible time. So what's it going to be like some other characteristics of living in this particular time of spirituality that we're living in right now? The apostasy. The apostasy has to take place. The falling away has to take place in order for the stage to be set for the Lord to take every born-again believer out of harm's way. And then God's going to lower the boom on the people of this earth and the earth itself. What are some other things that are going to transpire? Well, let's look in the Bible uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1, let's begin looking at that passage of Scripture. The Bible says, This know also that in the last days. Isn't it amazing how many times that God says, Now in the last days you'll be looking for this. In the last days, when you see this coming to pass, look up for redemption draweth nigh. In the last days, let you, you, you be aware that, you know, it's getting close to the coming of the Lord. But yet we're more interested in the hurricane that's getting ready to hit down there toward Florida and how much wind we might get this week and, and how much rain that might come over into the Piedmont area of North Carolina. Friends, we better start looking at these signs and be aware that the Lord Jesus Christ may take us out of this world today. Today, that's how close it could be. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. This knew also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Do you know what that word perilous means? That word perilous means dangerous, hard to deal with, savage. Some, uh, same word used to describe the demonic of Gadara. Demonic activities that are going on. We're living in perilous times. How many of you would go to, Wars, uh, go to Seattle, D.C. right now if I paid your way? What about Portland, Oregon? If, if we got Brother Michael here, he'd pay your way. Would you go to Portland, Oregon? Would you, Nancy? <laughs> uh, but how many, we're living in some perilous times. I talked to a young man yesterday, and he said, you know, sometimes I, I, I carry. You know, he said, I've got a concealment weapon and all this. He, he said, but they still some places I wouldn't go. We're living in some very perilous times, aren't we? And we're living, these are signs of the apostasy. This is signs of the falling away. We're living in perilous times. They're defunding the police departments. Are you kidding me? With all that is transpiring, all the criminal activity, all the looting and all the killing, and well, let's just get rid of the police department and that'll solve all of our problems. Is that not demonic? leading blind people leading the blind isn't that absolutely yeah who did you say idiocy idiocy yeah I, I'm glad you said I was trying to think of a word it was not offensive uh, but we're living in a very dangerous time somebody said well it's going to be nice getting back to the old western days <laughs> oh my lands I I I I appreciate all of those that serve in the police department and law enforcement. And I tell you what, we need to be praying for them, and they ought to be getting paid more. Putting their lives on the line every single moment of their, their existence. And protecting us with the best that they can. I'm telling you right now, I, I appreciate all that they do. But it's dangerous, hard to deal with. Savage. Uh, same word, if you go back and study that in the book of Matthew chapter 8, 28, you can look it up, and it will use that same Greek wording there that's talking about the demonic activities. When we go on over here, we'll find out in verse number 2 of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 2, listen to this. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. They shall be covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Boy, if I hadn't preached on that enough. Uh, but I'm telling you right now, that's an incredible the day and time which we're living in. Isn't it amazing? Without natural affection, truce breakers. That means there's just some people ain't going to get along with you no matter what. You know, have you, do you know people like that? 
You try to keep peace with them. You try to make peace. Truce. You know, you got a truce between yourself. You're going to try to get along. You're going to try to sit down at the dinner table, and you're going to try to enjoy a good, peaceful meal. You're going to try to go to work, and you're going to try to get along and have a peaceful day at work. But it don't matter. You're going to have truce breakers. That means they're going to break the truce, and they're going to try to argue and fuss and make your life as miserable as possible. How many of you know at least one person like that right now? You're not talking about me, though, are you? Okay. All right. But truce breakers. Look at that. In uh, exactly what we're living in. False accusers. That's pretty simple to understand, ain't it? That's people that are liars. I can't stand liars. Can y'all? But false accusers, they, they, they accuse you of doing everything. They'll accuse you of things that are not right. False accusers, incontent, fierce, despisers of those that do good. You try to do good, there's going to be somebody that's going to hate you. Now, it's hard to believe, but they're going to hate you. You try to do the right thing, there's going to be people that will hate you. Are we living in the apostasy? Are we living in the time of the fallen away? We sure are. So when you see that come to pass, what should we do? We're living in a time of incontent, fierce, despisers of those that do good, traitors, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. I'm telling you right now, if people are going to a church that ain't preaching the Word of God, they should get out of it. If you're going to a church where you just want somebody to tickle your ears and pat you on the back, telling you everything's all right, not going to preach on sin because it might offend somebody, not to preach on this, not to preach on that, not to preach on this other thing because it might offend somebody, you get out of that form of godliness. That's what God here is saying in this passage of Scripture, from such turn away. From such turn away. Many, many have stopped going to church and as I've already said many won't never come back many have already stopped going to church and many of them will never come back and Hebrews warns us about this and it warns us about this in Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 25 here God says not forsaking the assembly this is an assembly we have gathered together in an assembly. And God says, don't forsake the assembling together. Now, there's some people that can't be here this morning, but they're watching by Internet. They're joining with us by Internet. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another. We are being encouraging one another. I tell you, if there's ever a time that God that we should be encouraging other Christians. It's right now. If there's ever a time we ought to be encouraging them, if you can't come to church, then please uh, follow us on the Internet. If you can't follow us on the Internet, if you don't have an Internet, we can send you DVDs of the service. We can get them DVDs to you, or we can get you CDs of the service. But please, don't go without the spiritual food that you need to keep your spiritual strength up. We need to be exhorting one another. And especially when should we be doing this, church? What does the Bible say? When you see the day approaching. Friends, we're living in the latter days, right? And we need to be out there trying to encourage people to stay with God. Don't give up. Don't fall on the wayside. If anything, get more active in the things of God. That's very important for us to do. Because guess what? The rapture's coming. Now, there's a lot of people that are watching by way of Internet. There's a lot of people that are watching by the DVDs and the CDs, and they're watching television programs. Boy, I wish we could get on television. I really do. I wish we could get on television. And I wish and wish and wish that we could get the Word of God out even more and more than what we're getting the Word out. Because, listen to me, uh, the rapture could happen at any moment. The rapture could happen. So we've seen the first sign here that we're living in the apostasy. There's lots more I could tell you about the apostasy, but you got the picture. 
quit worrying about what the weather's going to be so much so, but start learning what the signs of the times are. And be concerned with the fact that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. Because I want to show you something in the book of 2 Thessalonians again. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this time I want to begin with verse number 7. And in verse number 7, look at this with me. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let us will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, if you study, some of the newer translations may have the word rapture in it. The word rapture literally means it's taken out. That's what it means. But in the King James and so forth like that, it's taken out. You won't find the word rapture in the King James Bible, but you will find the English translation of the word rapture in the King James Bible. And the English meaning of the word rapture literally means taken out. So the Holy Spirit is here on earth right now. Thank God. Because the Holy Spirit, whether you want to believe it or not, is still holding Satan to certain liberties. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when the Holy Spirit is taken out? I mean, how horrible is it going to be? It, to me, it would seem like almost like being a literal hell here on earth. Literally. And when the Holy Spirit is going to be taken out, because right now the Holy Spirit is holding the doors open for just a little bit longer, but I don't know how much longer he's going to hold the doors open because he's going to get taken out. But there's one thing about it that he can't be taken out until we're taken out well why is that preacher why can't the Holy Spirit he's God he can just be taken because we've got a promise what's the promise that reassures us that we're not going to be here when the tribulation starts and the Antichrist takes power and goes out and attempts to take over the world for Satan Jesus told his disciples, I've got to go. He met with his disciples and he said, I'd like to stay, but it's more needful for you that I go. I'm going to be an intercessor between God and you when I get to heaven. But I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Remember this passage of scripture. I am not going to leave you comfortless. And when the comforter comes... Now, remember when the Comforter came 10 days later after Jesus ascended back up into heaven? The disciples were meeting in the upper room. They'd been meeting for 10 days in one accord. Wouldn't that be so great if we could just get in one accord, every, all the Christians? But they were meeting in one accord, and the Holy Spirit came down and filled the room. I mean, it was just wonderful. And Jesus says, when the Comforter comes, and he clearly, dis, he, he, he clearly uh, shows us who the Comfort is, it's the Holy Spirit. And he says, when the Comforter comes, here's our promise, he'll never leave you. And he'll never forsake you. And every born again Christian, at the moment that they are born again, they receive the Holy Spirit in us. If you're saved today, you have the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus, God says, if the Holy Spirit's not in you, you're not one of mine. I mean, that's the Word of God. And when we check ourselves, we need to make sure that the Holy Spirit is in us. Well, wh how can we tell that the Holy Spirit is in you? <laughs> the Bible says that His Spirit will commune with our spirit and let us know that we are the child of God. Now, that helps us when we're in doubt, but it also straightens us up that when we're out here doing something we shouldn't do because the Holy Spirit's going to speak to our heart and bring conviction upon us. That's his job. He's going to say, you shouldn't be doing this. Now, to a lost person, the Holy Spirit ain't saying nothing to them because he ain't in them. But to a saved person, we know that we're saved because the Holy Spirit's in us. You let somebody get up here and sing one of these good old songs. Any, 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 anybody got any suggest? Anybody want me to sing one? But you get up here and sing one of them good old songs, you want to 
You know he's there. The Holy Spirit's there. And it's wonderful, isn't it? So the Bible here is saying that the Holy Spirit's got to be taken out of the way before the Antichrist can take power. I don't know who the Antichrist is going to be. Nobody knows who it's going to be. There's like five different theories, and that's kind of like the theory of evolution. I mean, it's a theory. It's not a proven fact theory. theory. I don't want to get into all the theory of evolution right now, but why do you want to believe a theory over a fact? God's word is a fact. God created this world. Fact. But when we think about this situation, that the Antichrist cannot take power as long as we Christians are here. But you think about this fact that the Antichrist could be alive right now on earth. We don't know who he is, or, but we know that he could be alive right now. If God takes us out today, he ain't going to wait 30-some years for the Antichrist to get born and to go 30 years and grow up before he can come in charge of the world or partial points, parts of the world. That Antichrist is in a position right now. He could just step right up into power. All that Satan is waiting for is for him who is holding him at bay. Read that passage of Scripture in 2 Thessalonians. Until he who now let us is taken out. Then that wicked one who will set himself up as God in the temple of God, and we'll get to that later, will be revealed. But he could very well be alive right now, and he could very well be on the stage where when the church disappears, and again, I say the church is every person that's saved, every person that's lost is going to stay behind. Only for the saved. Then the Antichrist will step up into place. And he'll begin a confederacy. We'll get into all that. Ten nations will automatically just join in with him. and They'll go around and do this, that, and another. It's going to be a horrible time. That seven years that he's going to rule, first part of it's going to look good economically and this, that, and another, but or God's going to start lowering the boom on this earth, judgment after judgment after judgment after ju I mean, it's incredible what God's going to do to this world during that time of tri tribulation, such as the world has never seen. That's, God's, that's Jesus' words. He said this world throughout history has never seen what God's going to do to this world during that time of tribulation. Man has never seen it. But the Antichrist could be in existence right now. But he cannot take power in that position of power, being authorized by Satan, being raised from the dead by Satan, almost raised from the dead by Satan, by mortal wound and all that. We'll get into all that later. But when we're taken out of the way, he'll step right into place. And this world is ready for him. This world would like to do away with Christianity. This world is ready for the Antichrist to come into power, and people will flock to him on a wholesale level. But he cannot until the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, and since we've got the promise that he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us, so guess who's going to have to go when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way? That's you that are saved, me that is saved. Amen. And how is God going to do this? We call it the rapture. The rapture is the taking out. And in the last moment or two that I want to share this portion of the scriptures with us, I just want to leave you with this thought that comes to us from the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 60. And this is just one place. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. I'm telling you, that just sends goosebumps all over me right now. 
They run from the tip of my head down to my toes right now. You know what that means? That means one day God's going to say, son, go get my children. And that means one day the Lord himself shall descend from where? Heaven. And the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now, where do you think he's going to shout? I don't know what it might be, but I know this. I'm going to recognize it. I'm going to recognize it. Well, my dad used to get out the back door. We'd be, I don't know where, down at the creek. I mean, or, I mean out, way out down in the woods. My daddy could shout. He'd shout, come on. It don't matter where we was, we'd come running because I'll tell you one thing, he wasn't going to shout twice. <laughs> and we'd come home and the Lord one day is going to come and he's going to shout. And then when he gets shouting, there's going to be a trumpet sound. And it's going to be so distinct, so glorious, that every child of God will hear it. And when that shout from the Lord comes and the trump of God is sounded, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then in verse number 17, it tells that those of us that are left in a split second we're all going to rise. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds. I mean, it's going to be just like this. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, right at that moment, I really believe it. That shout could come right now. We could hear that big trumpet blaring. It's all going to transpire, though, in the twinkling of an eye. Just that fast. Faster than that, they say. They say it twinkles faster than a snap. I don't know. Won't be hardly a tick-tock. It'll be like a tick. And guess what? If you ain't ready, if you ain't saved, if you've never been born again, if it was to happen in this next Second, if you've never been saved, you'd be left sitting right there in that pew. But if that trump of God sounds and that shout from glory comes, and I don't think lost people are going to hear it. I don't, I've never seen where it says lost people hear it, but we'll hear it. And we'll be gone. We'll meet Jesus in a half a second. You blink your eye, I could be gone. I hope everybody in this whole building is gone. I hope we all gone. But if you're not saved, you'll be sitting there. You'll be sitting there. But the rest of us, we'll meet Jesus up there in the clouds. I thought you said he was coming back to this earth, preacher. I said there's some things that's going to have to happen before he comes back to this earth. And one of the things that's going to have to happen is he's got to get all the Christians out of harm's way before they judge this earth. And that's how he's going to do it. He's going to shout. A trump's going to be sounded. And we're going to meet him up. He's going to come up in the clouds. He ain't going to step foot on this earth at that time. He's going to call for us, and we're going to meet him up there on the cloud. We could go right through this building. Right through the roof of your car going home. We could go through this building, the roof of this building right here, and we'd meet Jesus up there. I hope it'd be a billion people. I hope it wouldn't be. I, I hope it'd be seven billion, but we know they're not going to be seven billion. Statistics tell us people that, that not but like a billion, two hundred million claim to be Christians, but how many are really saved? We don't know. But we'd meet with Jesus. Oh, we'd go home with Jesus when we'd be with Jesus. Oh, Lord. Can you just begin to imagine 
what that's going to be like. But you don't want to be left behind. I'm going to show you next week clearly where the Bible says that if you reject the love of Jesus Christ when you've been given the chance to be saved, and if you're left behind, you've heard the gospel, you chose not to believe in Jesus or accept him as your savior, you'll be doomed. You'll be doomed. You'll live on this earth and you'll believe the lie of the devil because God says I'm going to cause a strong delusion. Everybody that's left behind, that Antichrist is going to step up there at that microphone and whatever he says, and it don't matter how ridiculous it might be, everybody's going to believe. It's kind of like a lot of things that are going on right now, right? There's a lot of people right now that are under some delusion. They believe every lie that comes across, and we can tell it's lying after lying after lying after lying. We can tell it. That's why the church has to be pulled out of the way, because we'd stand up for it. We'd interfere with the Antichrist. those that are left behind, they'll believe whatever he says. He can say Martians come and got them. And they, yeah, yeah, I've been looking for that. I know, I, I know Area 51. I, I've been reading about that. Yeah. You'll believe it. You'll believe the lie, but you wouldn't accept the truth. You'll believe the lie, and you're going to be doomed to hell. Somewhere during the tribulation, you could die a horrible death, but even at the end of the tribulation, you're going to wind up in hell. So if you're here today or if you're listening by the way of the internet and you've not been born again, you're not saved, you're not saved, you're not saved. Why, there's still time and you could miss it by just a few seconds. Literally. Why not now accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Trust Him as being the Son of God. Trust and believe that He died on that cross horrible, agonizing death as punishment for my sins and for your sins. If you're not saved, if you're here in this assembly this morning or if you're listening by the way of the internet, send us an email. Say, I want to talk to you, preacher. I'm not sure I'm saved, preacher. I want to talk to you. I want to help you to be saved. I want you to go with us in the rapture. When we're called out, I want you to go. I don't want you to be left behind. Accept Jesus. Let's stand to our feet. Our Heavenly Father, we join together here in this assembly, those that are home joining with us. Churches are like this all over the eastern coast right now, coming to that point of invitation, dear God, and where the Holy Spirit is certainly dealing with souls. And God, I pray that many souls will accept Jesus as your Son, but as their Savior and as their Lord. Lord, if there's anybody here today that has never been born again, it doesn't matter how religious they are. It doesn't matter if they've been baptized. It doesn't matter if they're a member of a church. It doesn't really matter, Lord, if they've taken communion at this point. Lord, if they've not been born again, if they, don't, if they know for sure that they've never been saved, they've never come and asked Jesus to forgive them of their sins. They've never come and asked Jesus to save their soul. They've never invited Jesus Christ to come into their life and to take complete control. God, I pray they would do so right now, here, by the way of the internet, or in churches like this through all throughout the world. Who knows but Lord, you might be holding the door open for just that one or two or maybe a thousand right now that are about to make that decision. And then it will be time for us all to leave. God, I'm ready to leave, and I want to leave. I'm a stranger in this world, dear God. People think I'm peculiar, dear Heavenly Father, but I pray in the name of Jesus for the salvation of any and all souls. And I pray for God, revival of your saints. I pray that many will not take part in this apostasy and fall away. I pray that we'll see the signs of the time, Lord, and know that it's drawing so close. 
Is there any that needs to come? Any others that would like to come? Would you come? Would you like to come? Well, God bless you for coming today. Don't forget to come back again and listen to us next Sunday morning as we continue going through this series of what's next, what all is going to transpire before the Lord literally comes back to this earth and what's going to happen after he does. And so I encourage you to keep coming. Don't forget about our Wednesday night service. Looking forward to that as well. Be much in prayer for those that are having surgeries and procedures and those that are afflicted and sick. Let's pray for all these folks in a very special way as well. But let's bow and be dismissed in prayer at this time. Our Heavenly Father, continue to be with us and to lead us and to guide us. Dear God and Lord, I say like Paul said, even so come, Lord Jesus. For these things I ask are in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all this morning. God